Okay, okay, very good. Yeah. Let's wait one more minute. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, I think we can, we can start. So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, third um, lecture on the mini school on the theory of open quantum systems. <clears throat> uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, today's speaker, which is again, uh, Graham Plaisance. Uh, Graham is based at, uh, is a postdoc uh, at, uh, based at UKZN. And with us is also, again, <laughs> Ilya, who will do the moderation of the, of the Q&A questions at the end or during the, or during the talk. Um, I think today, uh, Graham will give us, um, will speak about the microscopic derivation of the famous um, gorini kosakowski sudarshan lindblad equation that you saw uh, last week. And, and the idea of today will be to derive it from a Hamiltonian for a system plus environment um, setup. So, Graham, um, we, are, we are ready. If you are ready, you're welcome to, to share uh, your screen and, uh, and start the third part of your, of your lecture series. Thank you very much for being with us again today. Okay, thank you, Francesco. Uh, yes, let me just share my slides. Okay, so you, you can see my screen and it's scrolling. Uh, yes, you can see your screen. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. We don't have the problem that we had last time then. Okay, so um, yeah, okay. Well, welcome back everybody to this um, third lecture in the uh, mini school series. Uh, an introduction to open quantum systems. So as Francesco said, in, in, in this lecture, what we'll be mainly focusing on is a uh, microscopic derivation of the, um, of the celebrated uh, GKSL formula master equation. Um, so yeah, so but before diving in straight back into to where we finished up last time, I thought that I would spend um, maybe 10 minutes of, of this lecture just recapping some of the uh, most important um, ideas that I introduced in, in the last lecture that will obviously be important for, for today's discussion. So let me just go to this slide. Yeah, so, okay. So in last week's lecture, I basically introduced some of the, um, the key ingredients going into the formulation of the theory of open quantum systems, namely that a uh, open quantum or the interaction between an open quantum system S and its environment uh, B can be uh, described within the, the a composite system framework as uh, depicted on, by this diagram on, on the right hand side of this slide um, where the uh, open uh, or the open system of interest S is represented by one of the subsystems in, in, in this total state space and whose um, state can be, a state is completely characterized in terms of this reduced density matrix rho s. Okay, and the kind of, what I also mentioned is that the kind of general goal of the theory or the general, the kind of goal behind the theory of open quantum systems is what we want to do is to, to basically describe how a, an open quantum system evolves in time due to its interaction with the surrounding environment. So the kind of, um, I guess you could say that the, the, the kind of the first kind of naive approach to doing this is by basically noting that because um, this, we're, because we're assuming that this composite system, so S plus B is closed, then um, its um, time evolution will be governed by essentially the, 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 the time dependent Trojan equation. So the way that we can then describe this is by introducing the, the, the total Hamiltonian of our, of, of our system plus environment. And in general, we can write the, the, the total Hamiltonian of our system in the following way, 
where uh, HS is the, the Hamiltonian um, corresponding to just our open system, S. Uh, HB is just the, the Hamiltonian, um, uh, the self-Hamiltonian corresponding to our environment B. And this last term, H of I, is a, a term which describes the inter interaction between these two between these two subsystems. So just to point out that this Hamiltonian only um, contains operators defined on, uh, defined on this Hilbert space. And similarly, this Hamiltonian only do, contains operators defined on, on an environment Hilbert space, whilst the interaction term contains operators acting on, on the composite space. Okay, so to, so to derive the kind of uh, a general uh, equation of motion for this composite system, we can just write down a kind of general uh, the most general uh, uh, state of S plus B, which can be written as a, as, as a mixed state of the, of the following form. And then by taking the time derivative of this, or given the fact that the composite system is closed, it evolves under a, a, a standard unitary time evolution. So therefore, um, by taking the time derivative of this equation, we can then just derive the, the so-called von Neumann equation. So this von Neumann equation is effectively just the time dependent Schrodinger equation for this composite system um, but also so which describes the evolution of both pure states and mixed states so the time dependent Schrodinger equation only applies to pure states whereas the the von Neumann equation applies to both mixed and pure states so this is the most general form of the equation of motion for our composite system with this this, this Hamiltonian okay and as a as I also kind of mentioned last time is that we in in the description of open quantum systems we only are really concerned about what is happening at the level of our open system S. So we don't really care what's going on in our environment. We just want to extract information on how our, st our open system evolves in time. So um, the way that this is kind of, or the way that this can be reflected in this, in this equation of motion is that we can perform the partial trace operation. So if you recall, if you take the partial trace or if you perform this partial trace operation on a, on a density matrix of a composite system, if you perform the partial trace over one of the subsystems, you're, you're effectively throwing away any information that we have about that system. So by doing that in this equation of motion, we can set up a, an equation of motion just for the reduced uh, density matrix rho s, which implicitly describes the effect of the environment on our open system. So by doing this, so this partial trace operation here, we can then just derive this kind of equation of motion for this, um, for this reduced density matrix. So at this point, you could maybe say, okay, well, we now have an equation of motion, a, a very general equation of motion for this reduced density matrix. We basically, you know, we, we basically have a general description of open quantum systems. So while that's formally true, unfortunately, um, this equation of motion is usually uh, often extremely complicated to describe. So often um, in an ideal, in ideal setting, what we would ide ideally like to have is an equation of motion for this reduced density operator, which we can solve either analytically or numerically to basically tell us how this, this, this reduced density operator evolves in time. So unfortunately, in the most general case, that's usually intractable, just because um, if we're taking our environment to be, our environment B to be macroscopic, um, this equation of motion will contain information relating how, to how our open system couples to every degree of freedom in the environment, which usually is a very large number of degrees of freedom. So therefore, um, they're simply, this is just simply too complicated to describe in a general case. So following this kind of naive approach, we have to find ways to kind of simplify the kind of general analysis of, 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 of the, of, um, when we want to describe how an open system evolves in time. So what I then moved on to is, is introducing this, uh, well, the starting point of the simplification is introducing first the concept of a dynamical map. So last time I basically, uh, well, supposing that we have a composite system S plus B, which is initially prepared in a, or we have a system and environment which are initially uncorrelated such that the total state of S plus B um, can be written in the following way, then, the, um, then we can basically define a dynamical map V um, essentially using, uh, using this relation. So a dynamical map is essentially a linear map which transforms a reduced density matrix at some initial time to another um, density matrix, uh, reduced density matrix of the, of the open system at some later time t. 
okay so just to also point out that the kind of key ingredient going into the, the kind of um, to the construction of the dynamical map is this, this assumption of initially uh, of initially uncorrelated system and environment okay so just taking a fairly generic um, so if we basically just use the spectral decomposition of the reduced density operator of our, our environment we can then just plug this into the formula at the top so then basically um, uh, to write the the dynamical map in this following in this representation so these operators w are basically just operators which act only on the Hilbert space of our open system and what's kind of important about this this representation of the dynamical map is that um, it, it, um, it basically uh, emits a so-called Krauss decomposition such that this dynamic such that this map um, is completely positive and trace preserving so a completely so a linear map which is completely positive and trace preserving um, or this this property of the map basically guarantees that when we apply the, uh, the, the dynamical map to any re, um, um, density matrix row s it's guaranteed to always map this to another density matrix s at some later time so in other words it basically the time evolution described by this linear map um, preserves the positivity um, and um, trace one um, uh, property of our density matrix so this is just captured by this formula so I said that this um, this this is written in the, the form of a Krauss decomposition so essentially um, in a more kind of general setting a linear map um, any any linear map which is completely positive and trace preserving emits a, a Krauss decomposition in this way where these operators are the so, so these omega omega and omega dagger are the so-called Krauss operators um, and they the um, these Krauss operators basically satisfy a normalization condition such that the the sum of omega dagger omega over k is equal to the identity so you, by construction you can see that for this dynamical map that we've introduced here that these that these uh, W operators, which are the Krauss operators, satisfy this, this normalization. Okay, so um, in general, so I, we introduced the idea of this dynamical map, but in general, the kind of um, the, the time evolution that is described by the dynamical map is often just like the, the equation of, of motion that I introduced in the previous slide is the, the time evolution that's described by the dynamical map is also tends to be very complicated and therefore kind of hard to describe um, in a kind of general sense. So what we can then do is in order to kind of uh, simplify this, what we can do is introduce the idea of a quantum Markov process. So, um, so this dynamical map will generally describe a, a, some form of like stochastic time evolution at the level of our, of our open system. And in general, this time evolution will contain um, some type of memory effects. So by memory effects, I mean that as our, as our open system evolves in time, its state at any given time as described by the reduced density operator will be influenced by what happens at previous times. So to simplify things, what we can do is we can introduce a, a quantum Markov process and a quantum Markov process describes a time evolution, which is essentially memoryless. So um, the way, um, also, the, the way that to help with the um, to help with defining a quantum Markov process, we can um, um, we can introduce uh, the definition of a dynamical semigroup. So, a dynamical semigroup basically satisfies this defining property, and um, so any dynamical map that satisfies this is, is referred to, defines a dynamical semigroup, and um, this essentially gives us the, the definition. Of a of a of a time evolution, um, which describes a uh, homo which describes a quantum Markov process. Okay, so um, so given um, given a dynamic or um, given a dynamical map uh, V, there exists under certain um, there exists under certain assumptions another linear map um, L sometimes referred to as the generator of this of the semigroup, which um, allows us to represent the semigroup in this kind of exponential form. So you can see by uh, by definition that um, 
So from this exponential form, you can see that by definition, that this um, that this uh, map satisfies this um, semi-group property here, just due to the fact that when you multiply any two exponentials together, their exponents add. Okay, so in this, what we can do with this form is that we can, um, given the relationship of the dynamical map to the, the reduced density matrix rho s, we can basically take the time derivative of both sides of this equation to then show that the, the corresponding equation of motion for our reduced, um, for our reduced um, density matrix rho s can be written in the following way. And this, this is, so this equation of motion is, is what's called the, or was what, common, what is referred to as the Markovian quantum master equation. So essentially, the, this is just the equation of motion for a, for a reduced density operator rho s, which undergoes a quantum Markov process. And then what we, okay, so then what we went to go on to discuss was um, the most kind of how we can construct, based on the assumptions that I've, I've already mentioned, is the, how we can construct the most general form of this linear map L. So the assumptions kind of going, I, I, I didn't go over the, the, the details of this derivation, but the kind of general assumptions going into this, this, this um, most general construction of this map L is that we assume that our open system uh, or the state of our, of our um, open system can be uh, represented on a finite dimensional Hilbert space, so of dimension N, such that the corresponding Louisville space, so the, the corresponding space of operators, um, is of dimension N squared. And then on this Louisville space, we can um, define a, um, we can introduce a, 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 an, orthonormal, an orthonormal basis of operators on, on this Louisville space, um, uh, labeled uh, one through to N squared, and which satisfy this kind of um, orthonorm orthonormality property. Okay, and then with these assumptions, um, what you can then um, show is that the most kind of general construction of this linear map L um, can be given in the following form. So, um, so here these, so let me just briefly kind of um, mention each of the kind of components of this of this, of the, of this, of this map L. So in this first term, we can see that we just have a kind of a commutator of this operator H with the reduced uh, density matrix of our, of our open system or S. So this, um, this operator you can think of as a Hamiltonian, but in general just represents any self-adjoint operator. And in the second term, we can, uh, these, uh, we have these operators a K, which are operators acting only on our open system. And these are referred to as the, uh, they're referred to as either transition or Lindblad operators. And these coefficients, um, so gamma K, are essentially just, um, are, are just non-negative, uh, are just non-negative coefficients. So, um, so basically what this, this, this relation does is it gives us the most general form of the um, of the Markovian quantum master equation, or the most general representation of the quantum Markovian master equation. And this is what's um, also referred to, to this form of master equation is also what's referred to as the GKSL form of the master equation, which is, so this GKSL refers to the initials of the people who first um, derived this form of, a, of the master equation. So namely, um, Guarini, Kosakowski, Sudarshan, and, and Lindblad. Okay, so this is pretty much where we got up to last time. So what I, what I will go over essentially in today's lecture is the uh, how we can derive a quantum master equation uh, of this GKSL form starting from a microscopic model of some of an open system and environment. So when I say microscopic model, I mean that we start by specifying some um, total Hamiltonian H, which basically tells us, um, um, which basically might, you know, basically gives us the, um, which basically defines our model. So our, the model of our system plus environment and the interaction between the two. So we kind of, um, to do this, we kind of return to um, the kind of picture that I had at the beginning of this lecture. So with this, you know, this, this, this schematic on the right, where we have our open system, 
with reduced density matrix row S, and then we have some environment B, and we basically define, in a kind of most general case, we just define the, the total Hamiltonian of this composite system in the following way. Actually, I should, this should be HB rather than HE. So this index either refers to E or, or E or B refers to either uh, the, the essentially the environment B. Okay, so what we want to do with this kind of in this general picture is we want to we want to basically um, we basically want to derive an equation of motion for our reduced density matrix row S, and then introduce a series of approximations and assumptions that allows us to write this equation of motion in the form of this um, GKSL form of master equation that I gave on the previous slide. So, so okay, so in order to do this, we first start by, um, by rewriting um, the Hamiltonian of our, the total Hamiltonian of our composite system in the interaction, in the in interaction picture. So for those of you who are perhaps already familiar with kind of uh, quantum mechanics, I'm, I'm sure you, you already know about the interaction picture, but basically to kind of go from the, the Schrodinger tip picture to the interaction picture, we just um, perform this transformation on our interaction Hamiltonian, which then forms the generator of the, of the dynamics of the, of the den density operator of our, of our composite state space. So with this interaction ha picture Hamiltonian, what we can then do is um, we can then just use this to, to derive the, to, to again derive the von Neumann equation that I, that I talked about at the beginning, which is basically just an equation of motion for the density matrix of our open system plus environment. So in the interaction picture, the von Neumann equation is written in the following way. So this is the kind of starting point. Okay, so in order to, to proceed, what we want to do is we want to end up making an assumption that our system, our open system S and our environment B are only weakly coupled. So the way we go about kind of uh, introducing this approximation is that we first um, proceed to kind of formally integrate the von Neumann equation. So which, uh, whose solution is given, um, given by this line. And then we basically substitute back um, the solution into the right-hand side of this equation. So the reason that we, we do this is because as I kind of said, it, it allows us to basically perform this kind of weak coupling um, assumption uh, between the open system and the environment. So what we do is we end up, if we basically do this, we end up with an equation of motion, um, or I say, I should say that we basically substitute this into the right-hand side of this equation and then we again perform this partial trace operation to basically recover the reduced density matrix of our open system. And then doing this, we basically just get this, this equation of motion for row S. And what we've assumed is that, um, uh, that it, the, 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 this following property holds. So that the trace of this, this commutator, the, the partial trace of this commutator quantity is zero. So um, I won't, expand on this at the moment, but all you need to know for now is that this property, um, while it's an assumption, tends to be satisfied for a, a, a large variety of, of microscopic models of, uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, at this point we have this, this, this equation of motion for, the, for row S. And at the moment, this equation of motion is exact because we've not made any assumption or approximation. But what we can then do is to we can then proceed to to make a series of assumptions such approximations to kind of simplify you know in, in the spirit that i kind of mentioned before is that we want to kind of simplify the analysis okay so the the, the first approximation that we make is the so-called born approximation so th the born approximation with the born approximation we're basically assuming that we can write the um the um the total density or the density matrix of our total system plus environment at some time t in the following way. So we're assuming that at some time t that these are uncorrelated and that the state of our um, the reduced density matrix of our environment basically um, remains static in time. So intuitively, okay. yeah. Uh, can you please clarify something about the interaction picture? 
because there is a question and it yeah. is the rest of the total hamiltonian ignored when we are in the interaction picture i think this is an important question yes yeah, so um so um yeah you can basically you can kind of think of it in that way so what what we're doing is that um in the interaction picture what you're doing is transforming to a reference frame in which the 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 time evolution that's generated from this system um from the from the system hamiltonian and the environment hamiltonian is um essentially um how can i say um is 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 um is is not contained within this hamiltonian but it's kind of um it's kind of ex the time dependence generated through this part of the Hamiltonian is is, um, is kind of um, generated in in this way. So I, I kind of appreciate that's not maybe a good explanation, but um, how can I kind I of mean, do a better explanation? No, but the idea is like they this H S plus H E its evolution is is in U zero. So it's the time dependence and the form of time dependence of in the interaction picture is encoding the rest of evolution. So yeah, so it, 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 it's there, but it's just you can maybe elaborate a little bit why you want to go to the interaction picture. Yeah, so the reason that you want to go to the interaction picture is because it allows you to to make. Um, so th this is one of the approximations that I was going to get onto is that it allows you to basically formally make this Markov approximation, which relies on a separation of time scales. So the reason. I guess one of the so yeah, as as Ilya mentioned, when you perform this interaction picture transformation, you kind of remove the explicit dependence of your of your of your generator on this on on HS plus HB, and it is kind of encoded um, um, within this 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 um, this interaction picture or this interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture. But one of the reason that this is kind of critical for the derivation of the, the Markovian or the GKSL form of the uh, master equation is that you only want um, your use density operator of your open system to, um, for, or for the, the time dependence of the reduced density operator of your open system to be generated according to this, this interaction Hamiltonian rather than you know combining the time evolution generated through the system the open system Hamiltonian plus interaction Hamiltonian so yeah it's a kind of um yeah I think that maybe gives a better explanation but um yeah hopefully it'll become a bit more clearer but I don't know if there's anything I should I don't know if there's anything else I should clarify or add to that I think you should just continue and if the person have more okay, sure. fine questions they will pose them thank you Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, so Okay, so I got up to talking about this, this, this born approximation. So, um, so when you make the so basically the, the, the first approximation that we make in simplifying this, this equation of motion for the reduced density matrix or s is by um, assuming that the the total density matrix of our system plus environment, um, factorizes in the following way at all times so basically uh, remains um, so we assume that our, our reduced density matrix of our system evolves in time but remains uncorrelated with the environment and our environment basically doesn't evolve from its initial state so this is so this born approximation is essentially tant tantamount to assuming only a weak coupling between our system and environment so kind of how okay you could ask well, how is that how is the assumption of weak system environment coupling encoded into this approximation? Well, in, in, in last week's lecture, I basically mentioned that in, in general, well, in general, our environment can be anything, but in the most kind of common case, we, are we assume that our environment is, um, is macroscopic. And so when we make this kind of weak coupling approximation in this way, what this basically is saying is that when our system and environment interact, our, our open system evolves in time according to, you know, uh, uh, evolves in time in a, in a way that's generated through this, 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 this system environment and interaction. But so 
in that sense, our environment has a strong impact on the time evolution of our open system, but the kind of converse isn't necessarily the case. So basically, our bath, because it's macroscopic, doesn't really feel the, the interaction uh, or isn't affected um, at a macroscopic level due to this system environment interaction. And um, so, you know, intuitively, you can, you can think of that, okay, well, if there's only a weak system environment interaction, then you could maybe expect that the, 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 the state of our, of, our, of, our, of our environment isn't going to be um, significantly affected due, to this, affected due to this interaction. So therefore, roughly, it will just remain in its initial state at all times or only be weakly affected. Um, another way that you can kind of think about this is, is that our bath does kind of um, react due to this, due to its interaction with, with the system. But what happens is, is that our bath or our environment relaxes. If we assume that our environment is initially in, in equilibrium, that the environment quickly returns back to its initial equilibrium state. So throughout the time evolution on a time scale, which kind of governs um, how our open system evolves, the environment basically looks as though it's static and doesn't really evolve much in time, which, you know, uh, kind of follows uh, the, the assumption of weak interactions. Okay, so we basically plugging this Born approximation into, into the into our equation of motion, we basically write it in the following way. And then we basically make this, um, the, uh, the next approximation, which is kind of broken up into two parts. So this next approximation is what's referred to as the, the Markov approximation. So intuitively with the Markov approximation, so the first, or as I say, the first born, born approximation, we assume weak system environment coupling. With the Markov approximation, what we basically are doing is removing any memory effects that are, that are kind of encoded into the, the time evolution of our, of our open system. So the way that or the, the first part um, towards doing this is that we basically, um, is that we basically replace the, uh, so within this integral, or this, this integrand depends on the reduced density of matrix of our open system at some, um, at some time s, which we're, we're integrating over from the initial time up to some time t. So what we basically do is we say, okay, because the, the time evolution of our open system should be independent of its history, we basically just replace rho s or rho s at time, at some earlier time s by the current time t. So this is kind of just, you know, as I kind of said, we're neglecting any memory effects in the in the in the in the time evolution of our open system. And this, if we do this, we then basically generate this 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 equation of motion, which is sometimes or which is referred to in the literature literature of the as the Redfield Master equation. Okay, so at this point, um, we can see that um, that in this equation of motion for for row s. That, um, so we've made the weak coupling assumption and we've made the first part of the Markov approximation, but we can still see that the, the integrand on the right-hand side um, depends on the, um, the um, kind of initial preparation of our system bus environment. So in that sense, the, the time evolution governed by, our, um, governed by this equation of motion still kind of um, has some... Um, has some history of its time evolution. So obviously, we, through the Markov approximation, we want to completely remove that. So the second part of the Markov approximation is that we basically assume, and this is, this is kind of what refers to the, to the kind of interaction picture transformation that I described, is that the second part of the Markov approximation is that we assume a large separation of time scales between our, um, between our system and environment. So what I mean by that is that, well, we can define a so. Um, Okay, so what I should say is that because we basically performed this transformation to the interaction picture, um, well actually, so what, what I should say is that, okay, um, let me just quickly go back to here. So if we just quickly look at this, this total Hamiltonian, we can, do, we can kind of intuitively see that there are going to be kind of three times, or at least at the level of the open system, two time scales that affects its or that characterize its time evolution. So one time scale will refer to, or will be, will characterize the kind of free time evolution of our system. So by free time evolution, I mean the time evolution that's generated 
just um, with you know without this kind of system environment interaction, just if we look at the open system by itself, and and this will be governed by this Hamiltonian by the self Hamiltonian of our open system HS, and then there will be a characteristic time scale associated to the second Hamiltonian H of I, which is the the Hamiltonian that governs the interaction between our system and environment. So by performing this interaction picture transformation, what we've basically done is remove the explicit dependence in our reduced density operator row S on this kind of free evolution time scale. So it's kind of, th this time dependence is kind of hidden, but it's not explicitly contained now within our reduced density operator. So in this equation of motion, this reduced density matrix row S or that its time evolution will only be characterized by a single time scale, and that's the time scale corresponding to the system and environment, characterizing the system environment interaction. So we, we donate this time scale as, as TR, so given here, and we can also um, donate, an, uh, we can also introduce another time scale which characterizes, well, okay, it characterizes, um, it characterizes terms appearing on the right hand side of this equation, so contained within this, this kind of com this double commutator. But we can basically uh, introduce an, uh, uh, this, this characteristic time scale TB, which basically um, uh, characterizes the, the, the time scale, the, the kind of free time, time, the free time evolution of our, of our environment. So the, 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 the time scale characterizing the evolution of our environment without this, this interaction involved. So when we make the second part of the Markov approximation, we basically assume that the, this time scale governing the system environment interaction is much larger than the time scale governing just the, the, the free evolution of the bar. So, um, so in this, you can kind of intuitively think about this as what we're doing is we're, 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 we're basically, similar to the first part of this approximation, we're basically neglecting any, 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 any memory effects. And the way that we do that is that, well, with the separation of time scales, we can formally extend um, the limit of integration from, uh, from T all the way up to infinity. So this may not appear kind of obvious why we can do this based on this kind of assumption of the large separation of time scales, but um, hopefully one way that makes it a bit clearer is that um, contained within the right hand side of this equation are terms belonging to the, or terms associated to the environment, which, which whose time evolution is characterized by this time scale TB. And the kind of general kind of typical behavior of these terms. So yeah, the, 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 the typical time evolution of the, uh, the typical time dependent behavior of these terms will be um, will will follow some form of like exponential decay, and they will de de decay according to this time scale. So if we're, we're if we're basically making this assumption that the the kind of that the the time scale denoting the 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 evolution of our open system due to this interaction is much larger than that characterizing the the evolution of these terms contained within the right hand side of this equation, um, then then by extending this, this integral to infinity, we're basically, we're only picking up a negligible contribution. So, okay, like, I, I think I may be slightly confused a few things there, but I basically mentioned that, um, okay, that the terms in this right-hand side have a, that associated to the environment, um, have some kind of characteristic exponential decay that um, is governed by this time scale. And if we assume that this is fast enough, such that these terms drop off and basically are zero fast enough, if we extend this, this limit of integration to infinity, we're basically extending over a, a region in which these terms in this integrand are basically zero. So in that way, you can kind of intuitively think that we're basically, we're only, we're, we're only very slightly changing the value of this integral on the right, right hand side when we extend it to the limit of integration to infinity with this assumption of a large separation of time scales. So hopefully that's maybe clear, but if you have any questions, then please feel free to, uh, to, to ask any, and hopefully I can try to answer them as best as I can. Okay, so basically with these two approximations, the Born and the Markov approximation, what we there are then left with is a, a Markovian quantum master equation. 
So by just looking at this, you could say, okay, well, this is in the form of the, the Markovian quantum master equation that I gave um, in the earlier part of this lecture. But basically what we can then do is we can then um, make uh, another approximation. So the rotating wave approximation that will then allow us to basically write this in the, in the, the general GKSL form that I, that I introduced last lecture and at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, so just to also just to briefly summarize, I'll, I'll just to kind of, you know, briefly summarize what I mentioned on this slide is that the Born approximation is equivalent to assuming weak system environment coupling. And the Markov approximation, we're assuming that the, the, the time evolution of our, we're essentially assuming a, a large separation of time scales um, governing the, 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 um, governing the, the, the relaxation of our system due to the interaction and the, the time scale associated, uh, time scale associated the evolution of our environment. So in this way, we're, we're neglecting any memory. Okay. So in order to now write this master equation that we, we, we've come up with after making the Born and Markov approximations in, in GKSL form, we have to introduce another approximation, which is Refer, which is called the, or referred to as the rotating wave approximation. So the way that we can um, basically um, perform the rotating wave approximation is that we can um, we can write the, well, we first note that we can write the interaction in the kind of most general sense. We can write the, the interaction Hamiltonian um, in, the, in, in the following way. So uh, as I kind of talked about in the first lecture, for when you have a composite system, um, so you uh, or you have an, an operator which is uh, which acts on a composite system, you can in general decompose this operator into a linear combination of the tensor product of operators acting on either of the two subsystems. So essentially, that's what we're just doing here with the interaction Hamiltonian, where the these terms, so this, this or this operator a alpha is an is an operator acting on the, uh, on our, on the Hilbert space of our open system. And this B operator is, a, is an operator acting on the Hilbert space of our bath. And in general, we can assume that these two operators are Hermitian in the sense that they're a joint that's just equal to itself. So we can make this assumption without any loss to generality. Okay, so the way that we can then proceed to kind of make the rotating wave approximation is to, um, well, uh, in order to make the rotating wave approximation, we first have to kind of transform this interaction Hamiltonian into the interaction picture. Since if I go back to, let me just quickly go back. So if I go back to this equation of motion that we derived, this Hamiltonian that's, um, this Hamiltonian that's contained in the integrand, its time dependence has generated it through the, this interaction picture transformation that I mentioned. So, um, so, to make the rotating wave approximation, we basically have to transform this into the interaction picture. And the most convenient way that we can do that is by first um, decomposing these, these system operators A alpha into, um, into um, so-called eigen operators. So the way that we can do this is by, um, so we can introduce these kind of uh, new operators which project onto the eigenspace belonging to some eigenvalue of our open system Hamiltonian epsilon. So in this expression, um, this, this, this operator pi is basically an, a, a, a projection operator. And these, these epsilons are basically, um, or basically denote the energy eigenvalues of our open system Hamiltonian. HS. And so what we're doing to define these eigen operators, we're basically just taking this open system operator and decomposing it into the fo in the following way, um, using these projection operators such that the sum over these, um, these um, um, projection operators um, belonging to different energy eigenvalues satisfy this kind of difference relation. So basically, we're defining this, 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 um, the scalar value omega in this in this eigen operator as the um, as the difference between two uh, as the difference between well it's constrained this sum is constrained to, to 
to, to, to sum over energy eigenvalues which are fixed to this, this, this scalar value omega. So omega is just some value that we can, we can, you know, we can freely choose. But this will become hopefully a bit more obvious when we start talking about applications. Okay, so the, the, the reason that these kind of define so-called eigen operators is because with this definition of an eigen operator, you can see that it satisfies um, um, this property. So this is this so this essentially feature is is what's um, or the, these relations are said to define eigen operator relations in the sense that the that this this operator um, um, commutes with the or doesn't well, it doesn't commute with the, the system Hamiltonian, but it obeys this kind of commutation relation with the with the uh, the Hamiltonian of our open system. And so I won't go into the details of this because this I mean this is just kind of technical details, but you can basically just show with this definition that, that these operators satisfy these two kind of characteristic properties. And similarly, that the, the sum over all these, um, these values omega um, basically um, give us back our um, original um, open system operator in this, in this decomposition A alpha. Okay, so why, why we want to perform this eigen decomposition of these operators is because it allows us to very conveniently um, write the interaction picture transformation on this interaction Hamiltonian in a in a in a kind of very uh, in a kind of explicit or, or closed form way. So um, so yeah. So to 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 perform the interaction picture transformation on H of I, we basically act um, e to the i H S plus H B. T on, on the on the left and it's a joint on the right. So e to the minus i hs plus hbt. And because by definition our open system Hamiltonian and our environment Hamiltonian can meet with each other because they act on different Hilbert spaces, we can then break this up um, into a transformation just acting on um, each of these respective operators in this sum. So A alpha omega and B alpha. And so this, uh, when we just consider this, this, this operator in this sum, the interaction picture transformation is performed using this transformation. And because of this, this kind of defining, um, this defining feature of these eigen operators, you can basically show that, you know, uh, that, they, that this interaction picture transformation can be written in this kind of uh, closed form. So basically, what we can do is we can explicitly just, well, we can just write this, or it just generates some exponential time dependence of the form e to the minus i omega t or e to the i omega t multiplied by our eigen operator a alpha omega. So the way that you can kind of show this explicitly is by, um, well, one of the ways that you can show this is by um, using the so-called baker hausdorff theorem, which basically allows you to expand terms of this form, and then you can basically use this commutator property, this eigen operator relation to basically show that this is the case. Okay, so we've now performed the interaction picture transformation on our interaction Hamiltonian using these eigen operators. And this is convenient because it allows us to write our interaction Hamiltonian in, in, this, in this equation of motion that I gave on the previous slide in the, in the following form. And where, so in this, in this, in this relation, in this blue box, um, these these operators B alpha, so the the, the, the the time dependence of these operators is just generated through a similar type of transformation here, but with the with the environment operator H of, HB rather than H of S. Okay, and at this point we also make this assumption. So okay, that's just what's given down here, and then we also make the assumption that the um, that the average of these these bath operator or the environment operators in the interaction picture is basically zero. So, um, so this, this is, this is a kind of assumption that necessarily isn't always true, but for a large number of microscopic models, again, this, this is a relation that tends to be true. And I, and I won't go into the technical details of this, but you can generally, um, assuming particular properties, like if you assume that you're, um, that you assume that you're, um, you assume that your environment, that the initial state of your environment is a stationary state of the um, Hamiltonian HB, then you can basically always construct this property. You can all, basically, you can always show that this property holds, but I won't specifically talk about that. Okay. 
So I appreciate there's a quite a lot of technical details in that, but once we've now done, we introduced the, the, the kind of these, the, the, we, we, we now have performed this interaction picture transformation on our interaction Hamiltonian, we can go back to this equation of motion for the reduced density matrix row S, and we can then, um, so just using this form here, we can then just substitute that into this equation and, and um, write this equation of motion in, in the following form. So you can see here that we have, um, that we have, um, or you can see the appearance of these, these systems, so these eigen operators that we defined A alpha and um, A beta. And um, what we've basically done as well is we've, we've explicitly performed this path of trace over the environment degrees of freedom um, and collected this, um, collected this partial trace into this, this term um, um, gamma, which depends on these two indices. And you can basically then, um, so what this, what, what this defines is what's called the, um, or what this, we can explicitly write this gamma term in, in, the, in the following way. So basically you can, you can think of this as, um, as a kind of one-sided Fourier transform of these of these functions, or, the, or this fun oh yeah, of these functions which depend on the, um, the these environment operators that we introduced um, in in the interaction Hamiltonian at, at at times t and t minus s. So these 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 um, so these uh, kind of um, quantities. Um, are referred to, or what are referred to as the reservoir correlation function. So they're referred to reservoir correlation functions because they're in, the, well, you can kind of see that they're in the form of a correlation function in that they're written as the expectation value of, 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 um, of a bath operator, so B dagger and B evaluated at two different times. And using, um, and um, yeah, so you can basically just write this in, in, in this, in the following way. Okay, so I talked about the reason that we, we want to do this in, this kind of interaction picture transformation is that it will allow us to make the, in, the rotating wave approximation. So at this point, we can now, having you know substituted, having or having rewritten our equation of motion for the reduced density matrix row S in the following way, we can now make the rotating wave approximation. So previously, I talked about these. You know, when we made the Markov approximation, I introduced these time scales that refer to the the, the interaction between the system and environment, which I denoted T R, and the time scale, which basically governs the, the evolution of our, or governs the evolution of, of quantities associated to our environment, which I labeled T B. So what we can do is we can introduce now another time scale, which relates to the, the free time scale, or which is the time scale um, relating to the free evolution of our open system. And we refer to this as TS. So when I say the time scale referring to the free evolution, what I mean is the time scale that, that, that governs the evolution of our open system according to its free Hamiltonian HS. Okay, and typically this, this, this time scale TS will um, be of the order of the, 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 um, uh, of the difference between um, these these um, these values that we introduced omega and omega prime. So um, so remembering that these these kind of omega values were defined as, um, well, we introduced them. Well, these omega values are, uh, are determined according to the energy eigenvalues of our open system at Hamiltonian HS. So these basically so that what this this quantity basically defines is. Uh, the inverse between um, the difference between um, energy eigenvalues of our open system Hamiltonian. And so in, in, in this way, um, you can kind of intuitively see that, 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 that then that this, this time scale TS will kind of um, be of the order of, the, of, of, of this quantity. So, um, so basically, if we, um, if we, if we basically look at this a quantity and assume that omega prime, so basically we assume that omega prime is not equal. So if you, well, I should say actually, if you look up here to this equation of motion, 
we can see that there is basically a sum being performed over different values of omega and omega prime. So in this way, you can see that there are, in this sum, there will be both um, kind of what you can call diagonal terms, so terms in which omega is equal to omega prime, and this exponential therefore vanishes, and there will be kind of off diagonal terms where omega is not equal to omega prime, and these terms will have some kind of exponential dependence on, on this on this on this quantity omega prime minus omega. So if we basically assume now to make the rotating wave approximation, if we assume that that the, the characteristic time scale governing the free evolution of our open system is much faster than that governing the 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 time evolution due to the interaction, then what we can do is we can basically um, uh, we can basically neglect terms for which omega does not equal to omega prime. So intuitively, the way that you can think about this is that um, because we're assuming that, that that this quantity, well, in the case that this time scale is very is very fast, this will be very this this quantity will be very small, and therefore its inverse will be very very large. So this omega, the modulus of omega prime minus omega, will be generally very large, and. Um, so therefore, if we look at the, this type of, if we look at the this term in, in the in the in the in the mass, in, on this equation of motion, we can see that because this quantity in the exponent is very large, if we evolve this over any characteristic time scale like tr of the order of tr, then this term will oscillate very very quickly, and because it oscillates very very quickly, its time average will be approximately zero. So essentially, this is. What the, what the rotating wave approximation does is that we neglect terms that oscillate very, very quickly that depend on whose time evolution is governed by this time scale TS. So for those of you who have a kind of background in, in quantum optics, you're probably already familiar with the, this kind of rotating wave approximation where you, you perform an interaction picture transformation and then you neglect terms in your kind of equations of motion or Hamiltonian, which um, which evolve very quickly and, and kind of which quickly um, uh, will have a, a essentially a zero time average. So that, that, that's basically what we're doing here is we're just neglecting terms that oscillate on a very, very, very quickly. So by doing this, by neglecting terms for which omega prime is not equal to omega, then we basically just end up with this, we basically just, um, we just end up with this equation of motion for our reduced density matrix. Okay, so, Okay, so, oh, sorry, I think I've skipped too many slides. Okay, so, um, sorry, let me, so I think we have about just a few minutes left, but hopefully I can get to the end of, um, of the, this microscopic derivation. So, um, to kind of, um, so yeah, basically I've, um, let me quickly go, sorry, let me quickly go back. Okay, so we um, we have this master, we have this kind of equation of motion for our reduced density operator, but we at the moment we can't just immediately see that it's in the in this GKS cell form, i.e., that it represents a, a quantum Markovian master equation. So how can we kind of explicitly show that this after we made these three approximations, the Born Markov and rotating wave approximation, how can we now show that um, that this is in this this is in the form of a, of a Markovian quantum master equation? So the way that we do that is by, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to move things on my screen. Uh, sorry. Okay, sorry, okay, here we go. So, okay, what we can do is we can, um, we can go to this, these quantities, which are the one-sided Fourier transforms of our bath, of our environment correlation functions. And what we can do is we can basically split this in the following way. So we can essentially um, split this into both. So this will generally define a complex quantity, but what we can do is we can split this into its um, real and imaginary part. So its real part, which we denote as, as gamma, um, um, is defined in the following way. And you can basically show that this is equal to the, um, that this is, this is equal to the two-sided Fourier Transform of our of our bath of our environment correlation function, and it, 
I won't go into the specific details of this, but you can basically prove under certain assumptions that these um, coefficients are uh, are always positive or non-negative, I should say. And the second term, so the imaginary part, um, which we denote as S, can it can basically, which is defined in, the, in this following in this way, you can show um, that you know, obviously this defines a a, 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 a Hermitian quantity, so I is real. Okay, so with this kind of um, with this kind of decomposition to real and imaginary parts, we can then substitute this into the equation of motion on the previous slide. And we can then finally show that we end up with a master equation, which is in this GKSL form. So, so this is, uh, so in this blue box, this, 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 this equation of motion at the top is, is the GK or is the, is the GK, uh, the, the, the or this defines the uh, the microscopic form of the um, of the Markovian quantum master equation that we've derived, where um, this what we've what we've, we've introduced this kind of uh, this new term which we call HLS, which has the this de the definition. So basically, how you can get this is by just substituting this into the uh, into the into the in, into the previous equation of motion and then rearranging some terms. So this this first term here that we this new this term here that we defined is what's referred to as the um, as the Lamb shift or as the Lamb shift Hamiltonian. So the reason that it's called a Lamb shift is because well you can basically prove from these uh, these kind of eigen operators that we introduced that this um, Lamb this this Hamiltonian HLS satisfies this or it commutes with our system Hamiltonian. So the kind of interpretation then is that. What this Lambshift Hamiltonian does for our open system is it basically kind of renormalizes the energy levels of our open system. So it basically shifts the energy levels of our open system in a in a uh, yeah. It basically just renormalizes the energy levels of our of our open system. And the second term that we've introduced is is what is the term which contains um, 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 kind of uh, information describing the kind of dissipation and, and, de and decay of, of the open system due to its interaction with the environment. So you can, so this is, the second term is what we, what is sometimes referred to as the dissipator. So it's the part of this. So you can see here, this, this first, first term is in the form of a commutator. So therefore it describes the unitary time evolution. The second term here is, is not, in the form of commutator, so therefore it describes a non-unitary time evolution, which effectively describes dissipation at the level of our open system. And we can see indeed that this is of the form of the generator of this linear map L that I introduced when I um, introduced the concept of a of a quantum Markov process. So basically, um, using these two definitions, you can you we can we can say that this master equation is in is a, is a Markovian master equation in that it's in GKSL form. Okay, and just to reiterate, so these, um, these non-negative um, coefficients gamma basically um, appear uh, here as, and they basically define transition rates or decay rates of our, of our open system. And that these eigen operators that we introduced define uh, the, the Lindblad operators that I introduced you know, earlier in the, when we talked about the general construction of the of the quantum master equation. So this basically, so what we've just to kind of summarize is what we've done is we start we started with a particular or we started with a kind of general microscopic model. We started with some, you know, we started with a general form of Hamiltonian. We derived an equation of motion, an exact equation of motion for the reduced density operator of our open system. And then we basically made a series of approximations, namely the Born Markov and rotating wave approximations, and basically um, a equation of motion for a reduced density operator, which is in the form of a quantum, um, is in GKSL form, and, and therefore is a is a defines a quantum Markov Markovian master equation. Okay, so I think that I've I think uh, I've slightly gone a bit over there. But um, yeah, so I think maybe this is a good place to stop.
or I can also clarify. Um, I'm, ha I'm more than happy to clarify. I, I appreciate there were some points in that where I perhaps wasn't as clear as I, I wanted to be. So I can maybe clarify certain points if, if people have any questions. Yeah, Graham, thank you very much for another very nice lecture. Um, I think we had, I don't remember, one or so question during the talk. Ilya, do you know if there are more questions in, in the Q&A facility? So far, there is no more questions in the Q&A facility, but maybe we can give a minute to, uh, to yeah, open yeah, yeah. And, up uh, with one if they need to. And we could also allow some members of the audience to, to directly ask a question if they uh, raise their hand. Yeah. Um, maybe Graham, while uh, while our participants think about questions for you, uh, do you want to give us uh, maybe a, a quick preview of uh, of the topic of the last lecture next week? Yeah. So I think for the final lecture, what I will do is I will go on to um, talk about some applications of this of the master equation to this microscopic derivation of the master equation. So what we can do is we can start to look at um, specific microscopic models. So for example, um, found in like quantum optics and yeah, just talk about essentially applications of this master equation. Okay, okay, fantastic. That would be very, very interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, Ilya, did people start yeah. asking questions? Yeah, there is a there are a couple of questions, and the questions are relating to this A alpha of omega apparatus. And are these apparatus something like creation annihilation apparatus? Yes, you can kind of um, yes. Yeah, so in the most general case, so you you can think of in in particular situations, these A, alpha, omegas will correspond to creation and annihilation operators. But um, in the most general, um, in the most general sense, what these, these operators correspond to are, um, they define transition operators between different energy eigenstates of the open system. So what I mean by that is that I'm not sure if this is, you can kind of show this, this is kind of like a, something that you can technically show, but basically if you apply the, these, these, these eigen operators to a, a given energy eigen state of your, of your open system, what you can show is that this, um, what it does is it basically lowers the energy, it basically um, connects a, an energy, yeah, so if you basically apply this to, to an energy eigen state, what it does it, is it connects it to a, a, another energy eigen state um, of energy, um, of, uh, actually, sorry, let me reformulate that. So basically say you apply this, um, an eigen operator to an energy eigenstate of your open system, which we can call ket, um, epsilon, then what the action of this operator or what this operator does on your, on your, on it, when applied to this, this eigen operator is that it basically connects it to an, another energy eigen operator, sorry, energy eigenvector, but with energy epsilon minus omega. So in this sense, you can think of it as a transition operator in that it basically describes um, when applied to a, a, an energy eigenvector, it basically lowers the energy of your system by an amount corresponding to omega. And conversely, the adjoint of this operator, so a dagger does the, the kind of inverse. What it does is it raises the energy. So it basically connects an eigenvector an energy eigenvector labeled, you know, ket, out, ket epsilon to another one with um, energy out, epsilon plus alpha. So these are these are kind of yeah. So as you said, they, you can kind of think of these as ladder operators in that they, when you apply them to to to, to energy eigenvectors of your of your open system, they they either cause you to go up or down this kind of energy ladder. So in that sense, they kind of define transition operators. So hopefully that was a, that kind of clarifies things. Okay, and uh, there is one more question. Will you be visualizing the evolution of the density matrix of the system, either plotting it? 
Uh, sorry, wait, so can you repeat that again? Will you be visualizing the evolution of the density metrics of the system? Do you plan to visualize it or not? Like what, um, when you're going to get so the we, example? In the next, yeah. Yeah, in next week's lecture, when we, we talk about specific applications, then yeah, then it will be possible to, in particular examples, to um, to to um, basically solve the, the, the master equation. And then when you solve the master equation, what you can do is, is you can um, plot the time dependent behavior of, of different matrix elements of your reduced density, of your reduced density matrix. So in the most general case, um, you know, uh, this, that your reduced density operator contains information on both populations and coherences of your open system. So in, in the general cases, you can't really talk about plotting the reduced density matrix of your system. But in particular cases, what you can do is, you know, you can, you can plot different matrix elements of this reduced density operator. So this, this will either correspond to coherences or populations. So that's well, yeah, when, we, when we go to look at particular examples, we will, I can, yeah, I can talk about um, the, the, yeah, I can talk about how you can, how you can plot the solutions to this, this master equation. Yeah, Graham, thank you very much. Uh, Ila, I don't think I see any more questions. Or, or did the uh, check if somebody raised their hand? No, no. you're absolutely right, Francesco. Yeah. Okay, then um, Graham, thank you very much for the nice uh, lecture. Now we know how to derive master equations and uh, we are all looking forward to see how to apply them uh, next week. Yeah, and Ilya, thank you to you as well for the moderation of the of the questions yeah so and thank you of course also to all our uh, our participants and i hope to see you again uh, uh, next week yeah so graham again thank you very much for the nice lectures yeah thank you see you okay, soon thank you thank you Bye. thank you very much okay